you need to eat a lot of extra food to gain weight, muscle, okay, in an off-season scenario. You have to eat a lot less food to lose body fat in a dieting scenario. To maintain, you could eat just a little less than your off-season and you can maintain and not gain a pound. Or you can eat just a little more than your diet, you know, regimen and, and not lose a pound. But there's a big discrepancy between off-season food intake and, and pre-contest. created Species Nutrition with one mission in mind, to provide bodybuilders and serious athletes with no-nonsense supplements that work. I put my name and reputation on every bottle of Species Nutrition products. If you want to be your absolute best, join the evolution. Television, rxmuscle.com. This is Ask Dave, your 30 minute question and answer show with Dave Palumbo, the one week out of the Olympia edition of Ask Dave. Hard to believe, but in one week's time, you will be watching a pre recorded episode because half of our team will already be in Orlando, ready to bring you wall to wall coverage of the 2023 Olympia, the most exciting time of the year right now on the channel. We have multiple episodes, multiple installments of Iron Debate featuring Milo Sharchev and Dennis Wolf. And of course, the initial episode that we did with Armin Adivi and King Kamali covering various angles of the upcoming Olympia. Here is where it gets even, even better. Dave did one on one interviews with Jay Cutler, Lee Haney, Kevin Lebroni. All of them will be chopped up into the most juiciest bits and brought to you over the course of the next few days. So we have you absolutely covered heading into the Olympian. Of course, Dave Palomo making his triumphant return <laughs> to the Olympia in Orlando. Dave, just uh, five, six days away, we're going to be in Orlando, ready to get the ship going um, for the Olympia coverage, for Olympia weekend coverage. You know, I got to tell you, um, I really, really enjoyed talking, you know, with Jay, Lee, Kevin was probably one of my, one of my favorite uh, conversations we had because it really wasn't that much related to the Olympia as it was to bodybuilding in general and, and life. And, uh, you know, every time I interview these guys, and I've done it innumerable times over the last, you know, 15 years that I've been interviewing people, uh, the interview kind of evolves more and more. It's like, it, it's like a friendship with insights and we you know as we get older and wiser you know we we can pass on more and more information and i think that people are going to really enjoy them and it, and it it gives you a nice exciting feeling going into the olympia to see that not only are the fans interested not only are the you know the new generation but the guys that competed themselves are excited about the olympia and they and then they're and they're trying to pick their winners and it's like they're it's like they're they're kids again you know who are looking up in the magazines who's the the greatest bodybuilder of, of right now and we're going to root for them and so that that's brings us back to our roots of why we got into the sport to begin with because we love bodybuilding even if we can't do it ourselves and we're not doing it um 
we want to see the best bodybuilders in the world up on that stage battling it out. And we're going to analyze it. We're going to break it down. We're going to make predictions. And, you know, people are going to be upset. And I've noticed, you know, prior to us doing starting our road to the Olympia uh, about a couple of weeks ago, there really was no storylines. There was no people talking about, you know, different ideas. It was kind of boring almost there, I say. And once we started doing our iron debates, a lot got stirred up. And I see on now social media, I see on the YouTube channels, people are debating what we were debating. And I think that's good because that's getting people excited and it's going to create a lot of storylines come Olympia time. No, this is the, this is the most exciting time of the year because, you know, um, there are so many different ways to view any Olympia, but then of course the one that's at hand this year, um, you know, unlike last year, where I think last year you had uh, a good mix of 11 to 12 bodybuilders where you said to yourself, all right, you, you, you know, flip a coin. This guy could end up in the top six. This guy could end up in the top 10. This year, I think it's a little bit more top heavy, which is fair. But, you know, I, I think to your point, you know, when you hear uh, the legends talk, right, and these are legends who have paved the way for today's bodybuilders and today's bodybuilding, it's not just, okay, who they think is going to place where, but it's also who do they like and what do they want to see, right? Like there's one thing to say, like, and obviously, hey, look, so much of the conversation has about, been about Nick Walker, right? He is a little polarizing in terms of his physique and in terms of what he brings. Nobody denies he is a great bodybuilder, one of the best in the world, obviously. But you know, every, again, opinions are going to vary as far as what somebody likes in a physique, um, what they like about their physique. But the, the cool part of this week and what we're going to see over the next few days is that, okay, what do they want to see out of Nick Walker mm -hmm. on the Olympia stage? Or, you know what I mean? Like when he's going up against different types of physiques, what is it that they want to see in terms of what's going to give him the best opportunity to have the best placing? So I think that's really cool when you get into the, the nuts and bolts of things. But, um, yeah, look, uh, it, it's been fun to chop up the different aspects of this Olympia and to see what some of the legends have to say. But again, the um, Jay Cutler interview, we're going to bring it about, bring it about to you uh, in different installments. That's going to be actually starting tomorrow. So by the time you see this episode tomorrow, you're going to see the first bit of uh, Jay Cutler. And then of course the follow Lee Haney and Kevin Lavroni. Yeah. And then I guess next week we'll do our uh, official uh, Olympia prediction. From and, yeah. And I got to tell you also, one of the things, and I don't, I don't think you put the clip up yet, but one, one of the things I never thought I'd actually get out of Lee Haney was Lee Haney gives his his secret. Yes, yes. Drying out. Well, how right. he dried himself out, you know, leading up to his Olympia wins. Uh, and it wasn't with diuretics. So yes. you guys are going to want to watch the interview to get the Lee Haney secrets. We're going to put that 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 little bit up first <laughs> as a bit of a teaser. But that yeah. that's such a unique thing that you hear from an eight-time Mr. Olympia. and. <laughs> him to do that you know to dry out without diuretics so uh, it's again you are well served over the course of the next few days yeah. olympia predictions olympia talk and then of course everything else relating to bodybuilding and hearing it from the legend let's go to the question the first two questions on this show from the dave palumbo experience app uh if your doctor prescribes you a trt dose of test uh because tests are low on blood work but you were not on a cycle uh, and after blood work from doctor, you decide to go back on cycle and the doctor requested blood work again in three months. How many weeks would you say you would have to go off cycle in order for your test on blood work to be within normal range? I always tell people to wait about three weeks. I think three weeks is safe. If you've been off drugs for three weeks, your level should be should be down, you know, into a, a more normal range. They might they might even be low by them, but usually they're in the, the mid range, which is what you want. Yeah, I mean, you don't want to go too low because then they're going to be like, well, are you, are you even taking the stuff I'm giving you? You know, so I, I think if you wait four weeks or five weeks, you might be in the toilet bowl, your, your levels. And then it's going to look like, you know, you purposely went off the drugs or you went off the, the TRT, I should say, to, to make um, the doctor think that you're low. So you don't want to like, you don't want to go do too much, you know, in a sense. You want to kind of keep yourself in normal range. So I think that uh, three weeks is, is adequate. Second question. Again, these questions from the Dave Palumbo experience. Uh, if you're eating off season, 250 grams carbs, and you start the pre-competition phase, how do you reduce carbs until you start the rotational diet? That is how many grams of carbs would you start the rotational diet with? 
they're referring to, you know, by the way, all these questions are from the Day Palumbo Experience app, which is a an app you can download. It's $29 a month. You get me as your coach in your back pocket. You get all my videos, all the articles I've ever written, all my protocols, diets, off-season pre-contest, you know, all the templates are in there for you guys to look at. We put up a workout every week. I do a Q&A video, just like I'm doing Ask Dave. I do a separate one just for the app members every single week. Um, and I answer everyone's questions in an open forum. So everyone sees everyone's questions and everyone's answers. So it's a really good resource. And, and I got to thank you guys because you guys have really supported that app. I have a lot of app members and I know people really love it. And they reach out to me all the time and tell me how much they love it. But, you know, these are the, some of the questions we get. And one of the questions is regarding, I, you know, when I put people on a contest diet, a lot of times I start men on a, what I call a rotational diet. Some days they're getting carbs and protein. Some days they're getting kind of protein and fat. And, uh, you know, it's funny because, and I've said this before, you need to eat a lot of extra food to gain weight, muscle, okay, in an off-season scenario. You have to eat a lot less food to lose body fat in a dieting scenario. To maintain, you could eat just a little less than your off-season and you can maintain and not gain a pound. Or you can eat just a little more than your diet, you know, regimen and, and not lose a pound. But there's a big discrepancy between off-season food intake and, and pre-contest. And if you look at it, a lot of times I'll give guys the pre-contest diet. They're like, whoa, this is a lot less food than I'm eating. I'm going to lose a ton of muscle. And, of course, they don't. You know, they lose the, the you know, they lose some water the first two weeks. And then it slows down. And they can't believe it because you need a lot more food to gain. You need a lot less food to lose. And that's because your body doesn't like to change its set point at what it's set at. So, you know, if you're weighing 250 pounds, your body doesn't want to go lower. It doesn't want to go higher. And to make it go either direction, you have to do a lot. So, you know, for a lot of people, if, especially if they're carrying a lot of water or they're carrying some body fat off season, I'll put them right onto my rotational diet. I don't, I don't, you know, segue, you know, oh, I'll cut the carbs down a little bit and then I'll get down a little bit more. I go right to the diet. Let them lose all that water weight the first two weeks, which is can be anywhere from 10 to 20 pounds, depending on how big you are. And then everything slows down. For people who are head cases or who might actually be pretty lean, because I, I work with some people that are kind of lean in the off season. Those people, I might not drop them quite so low so quickly Instead of dropping them down to maybe 45 grams of carbs per meal, they might I might give them 55 grams. You know, it, it depends. And I kind of use my my uh, judgment from all the years I've been doing this. And I'm usually pretty right. Every once in a while, I got to feed someone a little bit more. Maybe I didn't give them enough food. Or every once in a while, I have to give them a little less food than I gave them. So, but by and far, it's 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 pretty standard. So the templates that I put in there are pretty good. They're pretty accurate, but obviously everyone's got a slightly different metabolism. You might have to adjust it given, you know, what your metabolism happens to be. Sid, you're, you're muted. You know what happens? I always like to clear my throat, whatever. And I do that. So I'm not coming over. <laughs> Thank and you for sparing us of you clearing your throat. I appreciate seriously. it. Let's go to our Instagram and Facebook Questions. If you're not already following us on Facebook, just look up RX Muscle on Instagram, official underscore RX Muscle. Love the name here. Chubby Guns Metal. <laughs> uh, Dave, how much muscle do you plan on putting on? You're looking a little bigger, really filling up your shirts. That's a comment that we've been getting a lot of lately. So, uh, how much size do you plan on putting on? Yeah. Well, first of all, I want to just say thank you to Scott from uh, Old School Bodybuilding. He, he made a special Olympia shirt here uh, for the Olympia Old School Bodybuilding with the little Olympia, you know, garb the guys got on. Very cool shirt. And uh, yeah, I have been filling up. I, you know, I don't think I've gained that much weight recently, but I, I think I've been, I've been trying to eat more food, which is hard because, you know, it's funny. I was talking to Jay Cutler about this. And we were talking, you know, he, he did his little, you know, fit for 50 challenge where he, you know, he did his six meals a day and he dieted and he, you know, he got leaner and he put on some muscle. He upped his, you know, his uh, TRT a little bit. And, you know, he said the hardest thing was to get all those meals in. He goes, I said, I know, Jay, because what happens is when you're so busy and you're doing a lot of business during the day and you're, you're running around, you, you, you forget to eat. And it's not a priority because, you know, you're not competing or anything like that. So, that's the hardest thing for me. When I hit good days where I where I slam a lot of food, I, I definitely notice the difference in me. And you know what? I, I hate to say it, but 
because I'm, I'm trying to live a very healthy, you know, I eat very healthy and I try not to eat junk food, but you know, you know, a lot of times we'll take the kids and I'll go to, um, you know, these burger places or something like that. And I'm eating a burger and fries and I eat my kids French fries cause they leave them over. And, you know, I feel guilty, but you know, when I eat that kind of food, I grow from that food because I, I, I eat so clean all the time. My body just gets crazy big from that type of food. So I've been doing that a lot more than I normally allow myself to do. I've been buying some more red meat. I'll, I'll buy like, and I know the supermarket, which is really great. The Publix down here has grass fed beef. Uh, and, and when you buy grass fed beef, you have to make sure that it's, it's grass finished too. So a lot of times what they do is they feed the, the cows grass, but then right before they slaughter them for six weeks, they, they load them up with corn, which is called grain finished. That's, those are not as healthy. It, it ruins the fatty acid profile. So I've been doing a lot of grass fed beef and I've been buying like ground beef and, you know, I'm eating, when I eat beef, you know, I, I grow, it's, it's crazy. So I'm probably about two, a good, you know, I'm a little under two, I'm about 200, I'd say I'm 200 solid pounds right now. And I have, you know, I have glutes and I'm, I'm pretty lean. Uh, maybe one of these days we'll do a reveal, but uh, you, know, uh, you know, I'm hanging in there. I don't know how much bigger I want to get because I, I noticed that as I've gotten bigger, my blood pressure has gone up a little bit. Like I, when I was 180, you know, after my cardiac surgery, I couldn't even take blood pressure medication because it was so low. Now that I'm 200, I'm back on my blood pressure medication that I always take and, I, and I'm, I'm at a good level. So you know, maybe I'll push it another 10 pounds and see what the blood pressure is. If it doesn't go up and everything's good and all my vitals are good, then, then you know, I'll, I'll push it a little bit more. But um, I can dictate how much I put on basically really by, by how much I eat. And if I eat more, I'll grow more, you know, and then I get stronger in the gym, which enables me to put size. So, so far, this is a good look. I feel comfortable at this weight and uh, we'll see. Uh, but you never know. It's kind of like... Uh, I go by my vitals. And I think that's what everyone should do. When you hit a certain age, you, you, your weight and what you do to change your body should be dictated by your health markers. If your health markers are good, do it. If your health markers start to go backwards because you're getting too heavy or something like that, then you have to back it off a little bit. And that's 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 my rule of thumb. And it should be your rule of thumb too. You know. Before we go to the next question, just a reminder, Dave, uh, for Orlando, you have to pack some species merchandise Oh. And uh, some species products okay. because you are going to have a photo shoot yes. uh, of oh. you weekend. Yes. So a uh, bit of a preview for the audience. Um, <clears throat> I know we've discussed this one in general, but again, new audiences, you may want to refresh, um, you know, I guess your knowledge on certain topics. Uh, this question is from Manuel Munoz Marquez. Explain the correct usage of IGF-1 LR3. Yeah, and you know I've, I've answered this question a thousand times, but I'm going to answer it again because it's worth noting. First of all, uh, if any of you guys watched the video I did with Rick Collins the other day, who is our legal muscle expert, you know, because uh, there was there's been some rumors and there's been articles out that they're banning peptides. They're not banning peptides. What they did was they put out a list of the peptides that are not approved drugs like BPC-157, Melanotan, some of the GHR uh, releasing peptides. They're, they're, they're not approved drugs, so you can't compound those legally um, because you're, comp you're basically compounding a drug that doesn't exist. So you can only compound drugs that are FDA approved because they have safety studies associated with them. So for like rejuvenation clinics, they won't be able to prescribe those off-label peptides anymore. But I'm sure the uh, for research only websites will still you know, have them out there, and they're technically not illegal. They're just, you know, but they're in that gray area. Now, long R three or IGF one in general is is actually a prescription drug. It's called Incrolex, so you can compound IGF one legally and sell it at a rejuvenation clinic because it is an approved drug, which is good. The key with IGF one, and and no one really. I, I think I'm the one of the few people who really has espoused this idea because I, I'm probably I might be the first person to ever use it. You know, in the United States at least, um, I got it back in 1995 for the first time, and it came from Australia, from Adelaide, Australia, which is where they first uh, synthesized synthetic long R3 IGF one. And uh, what I noticed was, and I've told the story before, is that it, when I couldn't, it was very expensive when it first came out. So I was using uh, 10 micrograms post-workout a day, and I would do 20 days of it. And the first time I did it, I gained 20 pounds in 20 days. So <laughs> it, it worked really well. And then when I got it in the next time, and I did another, I think I did 40 days of it, um, 
it was a little cheaper. So I did double the dose and it, it worked, but it didn't work quite as well. And so the next time I got it in, it was even cheaper. And then I, I did even more and I realized that it, it stopped working. It wasn't doing anything. And I, I thought about the whole thing and I went through my, you know, went back and looked at my books and everything. And I realized that IGF-1 receptors, okay, on the cell membranes, which is how the body recognizes IGF-1, are produced usually when you damage a muscle. So you work out your biceps in the gym, you do bicep curls, you damage the cells, and then the cells want to be repaired. So what they do is they send out IGF-1 receptors to the cell membrane, which then if there's any circulating IGF-1 in the body, goes to that site, binds to those receptors, and then obviously causes muscle hyperplasia. The problem is if you have too much IGF always circulating in the bloodstream because you're taking massive amounts of it, the IGF receptors downgrade because they think there's too – the body doesn't want to hyper over respond to any kind of drug. So it downgrades those receptors. And when you work out and break down muscles, you don't get an up up – upregulation of the IGF-1 receptors anymore. So essentially by taking too much IGF-1, you stop responding to IGF-1. So what I realized is, you know what, less is better. So if you do 10 to 20 micrograms, you know, per day for 20 or 30 days in a row, and then take two weeks off, let those receptors regenerate, because they regenerate pretty quickly, and then do it again, it works much better that way. So that's, that's the protocol that I give out to my clients. 10 to 20 micrograms post-workout, you can do 30 days in a row. I would only do it on days you, you, you train, you know, post-workout. Uh, right after you train, you take it. And it will, it will drop your blood sugar a little bit. So you definitely want to eat. And so you don't want to do it on an empty stomach because it has an insulin-like effect. That's what's called insulin-like growth factor. It drops blood sugars. So it will push, push his nutrients into the cells. And, uh, and then after 30 days of doing that, take a break for two weeks. Let the receptors regenerate. I also don't recommend that you use IGF-1 when you're dieting. Because it does amp your metabolism a little bit, but you really need to have enough carbs and, and, and food to really take advantage of, of IGF-1. I would just use GH while you're dieting. Save the IGF-1 for the off-season. And a matter of fact, when I started using IGF-1, I stopped, use, excuse me, I stopped using GH altogether in, in, in the off-season because I felt – because GH, I realized, was making me very insulin resistant anyway. So I said, you know what? I'm not going to even use it because – the growth effect I'm getting from the GH is from IGF-1 release from the liver. If I'm taking IGF-1, I don't need to use GH-2. But there is some research to show that if you take the two of them together, there's some sort of synergism. So you can. You don't have to do what I did. I just you know, I just felt that I, I gained better without the GH. So uh, and just use the IGF-1. But that's, that's my protocol, and that's the, the rationale why I have that protocol. Let's go to bodybuilding expressionist. Uh, what exactly was the 70s golden era steroid cycles? I've seen a couple of interviews with guys like Boyer Coe, Ken Waller, and interviews say the formula for them was to just, quote, pop a couple of Dianabol tablets, maybe six weeks, six weeks out from a contest, and I'm assuming they cycled off afterwards. Is this all possibly true? I think everyone did things a little differently. You know, I know it, the guy, it seems like the guys in California were big on, like, you know, testosterone and DACA, like, off-season because they – Remember, they would just go into a pharmacy and buy the stuff. There was no, they didn't have to like score the stuff from someone else. They would just, you know, a lot of guys did have European connections where they had friends that would just mail them stuff because it wasn't, it wasn't illegal. So they would use Decker and testosterone in the off season and, and they would pop some Dianabol pills probably as well. They didn't use high dose. They would probably do, you know, 200 to, to 400 milligrams of testosterone a week. They would do 200 to 400 milligrams of Decker a week. And, and maybe they would take, you know, you know, some, a few Dianabol tabs. The Dianabol tabs were only five milligrams. So even if they pop five, that was like 25 milligrams a day. And then pre-contest a lot, you know, they would, a lot of times they would cut the testosterone. They would do like Prima Bone and Winstrel. And, you know, maybe they would take, you know, you know, a shot of, of, um, of DECA, like initially some, some of these guys did use testosterone when they dieted as well, but the dosages were way lower than what they are today. But, the only thing that was really good about what they did was everything came from a pharmacy. They were, the drugs were real. And I can't tell you enough when you use good quality drugs, how much better the results are. And I think that's why, you know, even back in the nineties, I mean, there was, there was counterfeiting going on and there were guys who weren't using real stuff, but you know, if you had good connections, most of the stuff were good. I mean, 
there was a lot of American real stuff that was circulating for a while here in the New York area. I know that. Or, and then there was also, uh, I had a really good European connection from Germany that was getting all pharmacy stuff. So we didn't have to use a lot of stuff. The stuff worked, you know? And, and so I think today guys are like paranoid. They're like, and, and for good reason, for good measure, they're not sure if the stuff is real. So they wind up taking extra. And a lot of times they're taking extra of nothing and then when they are taking something that's good, then they're over, then they're taking too much and they, and they, and they get side effects from it. So, you know, what I recommend, and I, I, you know, I hate hawking my own stuff, but you, you got to test everything in today's marketplace. You got to go on my DavePalumba.com website, buy the Roy test kits, test what you have, see if it's real. And in some of the compounds, you could actually test and see how many milligrams the stuff is. Like we have a, a semi-quantitative test for, te uh, for testosterone, cypionate and anathate for decadurabalin and trenanthate, and we have one for, yeah, yeah, and that's it. So those those four compounds, you can actually test how much of what you're taking is in there. And you know what? You're a fool if you don't test the stuff. It's a $20 tester. I mean, it's not a big deal. The GH testers are a little more expensive, but GH is more expensive. So, you know, you don't want to be using fake GH either because that's an expensive investment to make and then have nothing, you know, that you, you're using. So don't leave it up to chance. I know it's important, but the, the, but that's that's one of the reasons why these guys, you know, used what they did because they the doctor would write them a prescription and they would just go and fill it in the pharmacy. And no one thought twice about, oh, maybe I'll triple the dose. You know, there were, I'm sure, some guys that were mavericks, but most people just did the standard, this is what Arnold told me to do, or this is what Robbie told me to do, this is what so-and-so told me to do, and that's what they did. Let's go to uh, Mike Molinaro. Uh, Dave, I know you're proponent of BPC-157 uh, and have had positive results with it. I have a shoulder issue and wanted to know if I should inject directly into my shoulder. And from what I've researched, the appropriate dosage seems to be approximately 400 to 500 microgram split uh, two times a day. Is that correct? Says he's 230 pounds. Um, also, he's asked if uh, he should use it in conjunction with TB-500. It's a little pricey, but I want to know if it'll be more beneficial. I, I use both. I've used both before. I, I For some reason, I feel like the BPC-157 was a little more effective. Um, I just got better results from that. And I did 200 micrograms twice a day. And I and, and you know what? There were times when I injected it into the area that needed it, like my when I had my ankle surgery. And But then there were times where I just I just was lazy and put it in my shoulder. I, I don't think it really matters if you do it locally. I think it's going to get into your bloodstream. It's going to get down to the area that's damaged and it's going to do its job. But, you know, as long as you're using sterile techniques, you don't want to get an infection there, you can inject it locally. That's not a problem, especially if it's in the shoulder. I mean, a shoulder injection is super easy. So you can just pop it with an insulin pin right in your shoulder twice a day, 200 micrograms of the BPC if you want it. Some people do what I was doing for a while when I was using both is I would do the TB400 uh, or TB, was it TB500. What, I can't even remember what it's what, what the number is on it, but I would do that one day, and then the next day I would be do the BPC. So I would stay, or I would do it the TB in the morning. I would do the um, the BPC in, in in the evening, and I would stagger it that way. But I was, you know, I I did it because I was really desperate because my my ankles. I had to make sure that ankle fused because I was very worried that if it didn't fuse, you know, the next stage is just, you know amputation. I didn't that wasn't going to be an option in my wheelhouse. So. Um, I used it very religiously for like three months and it, and it worked well and it worked really well. So uh, the problem is that you're not going to be able to get it from clinics anymore. You're going to have to, you know, find your own means to get it. And, and unfortunately, when you do that, sometimes you don't know what you're getting. But uh, the dosage that seemed to work well for me. Now, I had a friend who told me he he took a thousand uh, micrograms a day of the stuff uh, for his knee, but he has he was bone on bone. And I don't know if he was getting even a healing effect from it or an anti-inflammatory effect more so, but um, I don't know anyone else who used that much of it. And um, I don't think it's harmful at higher dosages. I just think it's expensive to, to do higher dosages. Take two, three more questions. Uh, aesthetic work, work, uh, workhorse. Can insulin for growth without the use of growth hormone be effective in an off-season? Yeah. You know, just, I get this question all the time. And... The insulin is an anabolic hormone because anything is that, that drives nutrients into the muscle cell is deemed anabolic. But it also is a fat storage hormone because it drives nutrients into the fat cells and, and can be stored as fat. So it only stores things as fat when the glycogen stores are, are filled up in the muscle cells and in the liver. So in an off-season scenario where you're eating a lot of food, 
you know, throughout the day, more than likely you're, you're very glycogen loaded already. Your, your glycogen stores are, are nearly full. So if you start just taking exogenous insulin for the sake of taking exogenous insulin, and we're not talking about a long acting here. We're talking about like short acting, you know, fast acting insulin with your meals. You know, you run the risk of getting fat, you know, if, if, you, if you're taking too much. Because here's the problem, okay? Guys don't take, say, okay, you know what? I'm supposed to eat 45 grams of carbs to this meal, so I'm going to take four units of insulin. They take 10 units of insulin, and they say, okay, how many grams of carbs do I have to eat because I'm taking all this insulin? So they're taking, they're eating food to, to feed the insulin rather than taking insulin to cover the food they're eating. And I hope you understand the distinction between that. So when you do it the opposite, the wrong way, you tend to have an, a, a, a much greater chance of getting fat. Now, if you have a metabolism like me, you could probably do whatever you want. You're not going to get fat. You might get bloated, but you probably won't get fat. But for most people, there's no benefit of doing that. You're not going to build – insulin doesn't build muscle, okay? It only can help build muscle if you're not absorbing your food because your body's not producing enough of its own. And how do you know if your body's not producing enough of, it own, of its own? In the 90s, I just guessed because I wasn't gaining weight. But now it's easy. You can go to Walmart and buy a blood sugar monitor for 10 bucks, and you can test your fasting blood sugars in the morning. You can test your blood sugars post two hours post-meal. In the morning, if they're not under 90, you probably need a long-acting insulin. If post-meals, two hours post-meals, if they're over 130, you probably need a, a fast-acting with the meals to, to help bring that down. And that's, that is a definitive uh, answer to the question, should I take insulin? If your blood sugars are good and, 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 and they're under 132 hours after a meal or they're, they're under 90 when you wake up in the morning, then you don't need insulin. Taking insulin is not going to make you grow better, despite what Milos might say. Now, once again, if you give insulin to a genetic freak who does not gain body fat no matter what because they got a crazy metabolism and they can't physically eat enough food during the day, a lot of times that helps because it helps them eat more. And it forces more nutrients into the cells that they can't otherwise do naturally. But most people are not in that situation. So most people, if they overdo insulin and they start guzzling sugar down to meet to, to feed the insulin, they're just going to get fat. Uh, and to me, that's not bodybuilding. Um, Bilal Hamidi, will you confirm that low flexibility slash mobility will affect and slow muscle gains, especially in the lower body. I have very poor flexibility and my legs aren't growing as much in the past six years of beating them. Yes, I, I'm, it's a very good question. I, I wanted to bring this up as a separate topic for a rant, but yes, I, I you know, because I have a lot of my clients send me video of them training. Like if I see a body part that looks weak on them, I'm like, you know what, send me send me video of you squatting. And I've noticed in a couple of my, my, my guys and, and women too, that they can't, that they're not going all the way down. So I'm like, all right, you know what? Your your range of motion is not big enough. Open your stance up, try to go below parallel. And then they'll send me another video like a week later at their next leg workout. And, and they're still not going low enough. And I'm like, you're not going low enough. They're like, I can't physically do it. It's a, my, and so they start winding up leaning forward too much. I said, well, okay. So it's a flexibility problem. That means you have to do two things. A, go for um, deep tissue massage to break up that, that you know, the, the pelvic scar tissue that's in there. And, and, and B, you've got to stretch every day. One day of stretching a week is not going to loosen that up. You must stretch every day. Matter of fact, you know, my grandfather, may he rest in peace, 92 years old he lived to, told me you got to stretch. He, he knew. He didn't get on the floor and do, you know, yoga stretches, but he would bend, do these, these crazy bends he would do every day. He said, you got to stay flexible. He goes, that's why my back, that's why I, I, I'm not in back pain like your father. <laughs> my father was always complaining of back pain. My father did nothing. No, I, he was an athlete as a kid. He did nothing as an adult. So I, every night, now that I'm 55 and I get a little stiff, I, every night I'm on the floor before I go to bed, I'm watching a little TV to kind of unwind. I stretch on the, on the floor watching TV for about 10 minutes. I do the hurdler stretch. I do split stretches. I do everything I can do to loosen up my lower back and pelvic, you know, girdle area. And you know what? If you don't do that, you're never going to be able to, to have full range of motion. Now, I, I'm, I'm very flexible, but even I get stiff. So, and it hurts when I get on the floor and I have to stretch because I'm like, oh, I don't think, I, how am I going to get my head to my knee? I'm like, I'm so stiff right now in my lower back from sitting all day. And I sit there and I just keep going a little more, a little more, and eventually it loosens up. But if you don't do that work, 
you're never going to have that flexibility. And if you can't do full range of motion on your squats or you're limited the way you're doing, executing the movement, even with leg press, you're not going to grow your legs. There's no way your glutes and hamstrings are going to look really gnarly and, and, and get that level of development, especially for women that want the big round butt. you got to have flexibility to do that. Now, having said that, women tend to be way more flexible because they stretch more than men do. But if you do the stretching every day, you'll have the flexibility. It's just like anything else. you got to practice. Last question. This is uh, from TU Photo. Thoughts on periodization as a strategy for training load sets and reps over time uh, for natural and enhanced weight training. I guess I, I'm, I'm assuming he means, uh, you know, changing up your workouts, you know, periodically. I mean, yeah. Yeah. So, look, I, I'm a believer – in shocking the body, you know, um, when I go into the gym, look, when I go into the gym to train, let's say chest, for instance, all right. Um, I like incline barbell presses. I, I feel like the, I can do the most weight with that because it balances more easily than dumbbells on me. And I feel like that's, that's my main mass builder for, for upper chest. And so I usually start with that. And then after that, I kind of say to myself, all right, well, what am I going to do now? Sometimes I'll do incline dumbbell presses. Sometimes I'll do flat dumbbell presses. Sometimes I'll go to a machine. Sometimes I'll do, uh, maybe I might start, you know, with, with cable crossovers. So, but I always try to keep the, the, the basic movement in, in there. So if, maybe one day I won't do inclined barbell presses. I'll do inclined dumbbell presses I'll start with. And, and then I try to find something. Else. Maybe I'll use a hammer strength machine after that. Or, you know, once I do my, my, my free weight, you know, basic movement with full range of motion, then I feel like I can switch it around. So I'm always changing my workouts based on how I feel. And if I'm bored, sometimes I, I just want to do the same thing I did the week before. I don't know. I'm just like, for some reason, I feel like I, I, I want to repeat it. I had a good workout the week before. I want to do it again. I feel like I'm making progress. My, my, the weights are going up on my bench because it took me a very long time after my shoulder replacements to have the the nerve to, to start benching heavier again. And so I, you know, I started out with like, tens on each side of the bar you know now i'm doing you know you know 185 which i never thought i'd even get up to and i'm sure i'll probably get to 225 and i probably never go past there i don't need it to be but i had it it was like starting over really because it's like you know i don't have pain in my shoulders i just don't have the strength because i hadn't benched for so many years and um you know you have to have that in the back of your mind you know when you when you're doing these things and so as far as changing up the work, it's good to shock your body. You know, I don't, I never do the same four back, you know, exercises when I do back. I always change them up. And, you know, there's usually one that's pretty consistent, maybe bent over rows, but I might do bent over rows on a cable machine versus a Smith machine versus free weights. And that's, that's what I do. But, you know, I don't necessarily think you have to do an overhaul of your entire workout every time. I do, for my clients, give them a, a power phase workout. Uh, which is more basic core movements during their off season when they're eating the most heavily and when they're taking their cycle to put on size. And I'll do that six to eight weeks and then, then that's it. And when we go back to more conventional type of workout, but you know, you have to, you have to change things up and you should. And I, I think that uh, the guys that are the most productive in the gym are the people that are kind of go by instinct. Don't, make excuses why you don't want to do the basic movements, but there's nothing wrong with changing up exercises to kind of shock your body and kind of, you know, get your mind thinking in another direction. Like every once in a while, I'm like, I don't know what I want to do for back. You know what? I haven't done pullovers in a million, million years. I'm going to get on the Nautilus pullover machine and I'm going to do five sets on there just because I've never done it and in, in not in four or five months. And I'm sore the next day. So that's, that's how I handle it. That's going to do for this episode of Ask Dave. Reminder on the channel right now, installments of pre-Olympia Iron Debate, Milo Sharchev, Dennis Wolf, of course, our previous episode with King Kamali and Arman Adibi. Uh, coming up over the next few days, installments featuring Jay Cutler, Lee Haney, and Kevin Lavroni, all the way riding into next week where we will do our official Olympia predictions. If you haven't already done so, subscribe below, hit the notification bell. You're not going to miss everything that we have planned for you over the course of the next few days leading into the Olympia. And then, of course, the Olympia weekend itself. Dave's going to be there, so we're going to have all sorts of content planned for you throughout the course of the weekend. And then, of course, after the Friday night show and Saturday night show, we will go live. Uh, Dave's not going to be in studio, but we will have 
the likes of John Romano, of Lee Priest, of uh, King Kamali, perhaps Dennis Wolf as well. But it is going to be a star-studded affair live as soon as the shows end. We're going to be live on the RX Muscle YouTube channel. Uh, we're going to be also doing our wrap-ups on site. Uh, you never know who's going to end up showing up there, especially with Dave around. So this is going to be a lot of fun, and we can't wait to bring that all to you. So again, if you subscribe below, hit the notification bell, you're not going to miss any thing that we have coming up over the course of the next week, week and a half. If you like what you're watching, hit the like button, comment below. As always, we appreciate all of your support. For Dave Palumbo, I'm Sadiq Faruqi. We'll see you next time.